Hello, and welcome back to another tutorial on Sol. Uh, today, we're not going to write any code, but uh, instead I'll show you how to develop Sol locally in your computer and not within the online IDE that we've been using so far. Running Sol locally in your computer provides some additional benefits when we're developing, uh, but in this video, I'll just show you how to do the installation. Also, all the subsequent videos will also be done locally, not within the online IDE, so this is certainly interesting for you to watch. Now, there are a couple of disclaimers that I have to make. For this, you need to be fairly familiar with the command line, so you should know how to change directories, what flags are, and all that. Uh, I'm not going to explain every single command I'm making here. Josh has a great tutorial on that, so check that out if you're not familiar with it. Uh, being familiar is um, a somewhat slippery slope, but after some practice, you'll be there in no time, that I'm sure of. Uh, you also need to have Visual Studio Code installed. Uh, I'm sure you all know how to install an application, so go ahead and do that first if you want to follow along. Also, I'm on a Mac and I use iTerm2. If you're in Windows, the steps are somewhat similar. You may need to do some bits of Googling. But as I'm only on a Mac, I can only show you how it's done on a Mac. But Linux and Windows users, uh, you'll figure it out, I'm sure. So you need to download two things from the repository. One is the command line release itself. So in the Sol repo on GitHub, you can go to the releases page and download the binaries for your operating system. Just click the corresponding one and you will get a zip file for that. And for installing the syntax highlighter, you need the repository itself. Uh, you can simply use a git clone command to copy it in the folder of a choice. Here I have a repo folder where I'm just gonna clone the repo into. Now, as I said earlier, you can use Sol by using the command line, and it provides actually some neat features that make it really, really fun to write your patches with. Once you've downloaded the release, you can unzip it, and the next thing you need to do is you need to put them in the correct folder in your computer. What I do is I usually go to the root directory by typing cd slash, and then go to the user folder, then local, and that's where my bin folder sits. If you use the command open and then dot, the finder pops up exactly in that directory. On Windows, the command is explorer and then dot. And the next thing you have to do is you just have to drag and drop the binaries in the folder. And if you have a previous version already, you can just go ahead and overwrite that. The next thing I'd recommend you to do is to create a folder where all your sole projects live. So as you can see, I have one on my desktop. And if I change to this folder in iterm2, I have a couple of commands that Sol provides. If you type Sol and then version, this gives you the current release that you have installed. And then Sol help is what you will probably need all the time in the beginning. This prints out what each of the commands do and what their flags specify. So to demonstrate this, let's just make a new Sol project. We can say Sol create and then specify if we need a defect or a MIDI synth. If you don't specify it, it will give you some boilerplate code for a MIDI synth. Uh, I don't want that, so I'll say dash dash effect, which specifies an audio effect. I can also specify an output folder that will be created automatically if it doesn't exist already by just providing the flag dash dash output. And once these files are created, we can then enter this directory. If we take a look at this boilerplate code in Visual Studio Code, we can see that this is very, very similar to the game processor that we wrote in a previous video. And this is, again, the boilerplate code from where you can build your own DSP. To then compile our Sol patch, we have a couple of commands in our toolbox. So Sol play will actually open another application. Uh, note that we have to specify the corresponding Sol patch file, not the Sol file. Um, why we need to do this, uh, I, will, I will explain that in a later video. Now, by default, the audio input to the patch is your microphone input and the application is smart enough to put a slider according to the annotation that we specified. Uh, as I said in the previous video, Sol is always compiled within a host application. And in this case, we call the host application from the command line. And here's the fun part, I'll demonstrate this quickly. If we change our Sol file and hit safe, the patch actually gets recompiled under the hood. And if we introduce any errors, we get a corresponding message within our application. So there's no manual recompiling involved. This is all done under the hood. And I think this is actually very, very convenient to develop in. Now, speaking of convenient, what's not convenient is the lack of syntax highlighting that we have in Visual Studio Code currently. So to solve this, there is a syntax highlighter for Visual Studio Code. You can find that syntax highlighter in the repo that we cloned earlier. We just have to put it into the appropriate folder. 
On Mac, this sits in the home folder, which you can access with this tilde character. And then there's a folder called .vscode. I'll do the same thing, navigate there, open it in my finder, and move the highlighter in there. And if we then close Visual Studio Code and open it again, all the .sol files within VS Code, you will have some proper syntax highlighting right there. So I think that makes it much, much more convenient. Uh, so yeah, this was a somewhat different video in the sense that we didn't write any code today. But you can now write Sol locally and evaluate your DSP code by using some command line tools that are provided from the repo. We'll also explore the option of using it within Waveform, a very powerful and free DW in a later video. But until then, take care and stay safe.